My guest today in the Nimatayan is Christopher Vogler, and together we are spinning a yarn. <laughs> yes. Chris is um, most known, I think, uh, for writing The Writer's Journey, um, a defining book on script writing, and it certainly had a huge impact on me. You were um, a script consultant and um, a script writer in Hollywood. You were a studio executive. Um, you worked in story development. So it's a big honor to have you here, to have an expert on storytelling. Well, I feel I'm in good company. Uh, I can tell from some of the props in your background that uh, you have this uh, uh, very, very ancient heritage uh, that you're drawing on. And that's what I like to see. Yeah. Thank you for taking the, uh, the time, Chris. What has been your favorite story as a child? Well, I would say, you know, the, the thing that was lucky for me was that my mother and my grandmother particularly loved to read to me. So I had this sort of, uh, they had musical voices. And so I loved to hear them read. And one of the stories that I remember quite well uh, was Jack and the Beanstalk from the, ba the basic, you know, Grimm's fairy tales. So actually, it's an English story, but I think it exists in many, many cultures, like most of them do. Uh, but, you know, this was one I related to as a child because it deals with the differences in size. And, you know, children can relate to it and fantasize as I did because um, you know, the boy is very small and he's going to the land of the giants. And uh, also, uh, you know, that story, I think, set a certain uh, pattern for me, which is uh, that there's something missing in the family at the beginning. It's just the boy and his mother in most of the stories. So they don't talk about it much, but the father's missing. So it seems... Uh, this is a principle to get sympathy for the character. They often are uh, orphaned or one parent is missing or something's not complete in the family. Uh, and then he has to you know, uh, uh, deal with having been swindled, uh, which I can relate to as an adult. I've been taken uh, by people who sold me magic beans uh, on the street. Uh, you know, that's a very common thing as you travel. So, um, I, I got a little preview of that. And then the boy climbs up, the, the beans actually work, the magic works, and he goes up there and has his confrontation with the giant. But I remember uh, asking my mother and grandmother, uh, okay, this is a giant, right? Well, how big are we talking here? You know, is he, uh, could I climb inside his shoe or, you know, would he step on me like a bug or how big is this guy? And they said, very, very, very big. So my mind took that in. And uh, the thing that I'll never forget is uh, we had a nice big backyard and at the very back of the yard was a forest. And on the other side was wilderness, you know, with snakes and deer and wild animals. Um, this was in Missouri in the middle of the US. Um, and after hearing the story, Jack and the Beanstalk, um, I was just sort of the next day in a daydream state, thinking about the story and how big the giants are. And looking out at this backyard, suddenly my imagination created a giant. And I saw this enormous boot come over the trees and step into my backyard. And I literally was pushed back by this image. It was all in my mind. But I saw, wow, the imagination is that strong. It can actually scare me and cause me to physically react. Uh, and so uh, I was impressed by that and I kind of kept that to myself. Wow, the power of my imagination, can, it, it can even scare me. Uh, and, and many of those stories are scary uh, on, on purpose and we get that, we like that we have a little delicious feeling about being scared so that was the the beginning one um, and uh, it, it caused me to think about um, what could we do with this as movies you know I wanted to see the movie of this and I think that put me on the trail 
to being all these things you talk about, uh, script writer, story analyst, uh, executive, trying to decide, help them decide what stories to pursue, um, but always with this uh, idea of, uh, of using the imagination and uh, uh, following the clues that are embedded in those little stories. They're very short little things, but they are packed and you can get, you can just keep pulling uh, images and inspirations out of them forever. So that, that was the, the first one. Yeah. And yes. <laughs> I, uh, in, in my imagination, um, I, I saw your, climbing up a tree in this uh, woods in Missouri to reach sky country where, where the giants live. Did you, did you sure. do that? Um, yes, I, I think I have um, in uh, a, another kind of unexpected way because this deals um, a, a little bit with, that's a shamanic story. Right. It's like a shamanic dream ah. because the shamans, when they go into their trances, either through drumming or dancing or taking some kind of uh, plant that alters their consciousness, they often will go up ladders like that uh, into the sky and then have some kind of experience with these otherworldly beings. And some of them are huge and scary and some of them are small and helpful like little uh, spirits or fairies or gnomes. And um, I've had a, a fair amount of experience with that experimenting with uh, altered states of consciousness by many means, you know, not, not just uh, magic mushrooms or something like that, but uh, every way I could try, you know, uh, and, and that is part of the pattern uh, of the lessons that are given to you when you open yourself yeah. to that yeah. world. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I remember when we met, I think it was in 1998 in, in Vienna, when you gave a seminar on the hero's journey. The first thing uh, you did was you took a pack of tarot cards, put it on the table <laughs> and said, I confess I was a hippie. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew great teacher, great person. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I'm sure you had many of these um, adventures. Yes. And, and yes. they are real. They are not physically, but they are real worlds. Yeah. Well, I, I I am counseling a young friend now who is ready to go begin to experiment with these things, and um, I said to him, "It's like going to school, and the spirits on the other side, uh, which are reflected in these old stories, mm -hmm. those spirits uh, are eager to talk to us, and they have things to tell us." Yeah. about how the world is now. I mean, that's one of the first things that happens when you go into that other world is you, you hear a shout of pain from the world. The world is saying, oh, oh, what are you doing to me? You know, the poor mother earth uh, screams when you first come near her. Um, but then, you know, she embraces you and has some lessons to teach you that you can bring back. Uh, just as the boy goes up and he comes back down again with uh, a little different view of his power and, you know, of, of the way the world is made. Yeah. So uh, uh, this, this is what I think happens when, when we open ourselves, like I say, to uh, these other things. Even if only in the imagination, you still can get these lessons. Wonderful put. Yeah. But you were trying to, to tell another story. Yes, um, the, the thing that also came to mind with your great question was a, a book called um, Knight's Castle by a man named Edward Eager, uh, like uh, to be eager to do something. And um, the context of this is that this uh, book was written uh, in the early 1950s around the time a movie called Ivanhoe came out. And Ivanhoe was... Uh, story about the Middle Ages and the Crusades and uh, Robin Hood is in it. And uh, it's uh, kind of like a, a, a fairy tale in its way. Um, but the story was about three children and uh, they were playing with a toy castle. Uh, and the circumstance was two of the kids were brother and sister and uh, their father 
had to go to the hospital, very serious operation of some kind. He might not survive. So they were sent to live with, uh, I think, a cousin. And the cousin was a single boy, and he was kind of bratty and uh, irreverent and uh, wasn't raised as well as they, he was kind of selfish. Um, and the kids discovered they were given this castle, this toy castle with knights, and uh, they wanted to play the scenario from this movie from Ivanhoe. And so they gave different uh, identities to the, the little uh, figures, the little knights. Um, but then they discovered one of the knights was magical and they were granted three wishes. And each night, a different child would set up the castle before they went to bed. And he, he or she would put everything where they wanted it to be. And then they would go to sleep and dream about it. And it would come to life and they would be in the castle the same size as the toys. And the toys all came to life and had adventures. So the first night the boy has it and it's very conventional. It's very much like the movie and he's the hero and Robin Hood is a good guy. Um, the girl takes over the second night and it goes a little bit sideways and she adds some things to it that the boy doesn't quite like and you know things that girls would bring into it. Uh, and then the third night, the kind of bratty cousin takes over and he doesn't care anything about the traditions he brings in spaceships and you know uh, space pistols and all kinds of things that don't belong, uh, and it kind of irritates the other kids. But it makes uh, a great adventure, and um, that really stuck with me in later life. At, first of all, as a warning about uh, how difficult it is to collaborate with other people, <laughs> you know, because they were writing uh, stories. And, um, and then having their imagination, you know, fulfill them in their dreams. Um, and uh, they had to submit to uh, collaboration and realize that the other person's ideas are gonna take this in a different direction. And uh, that's, that's difficult for writers at first because they wanna control everything, you know, but the reality is you will have to collaborate somehow with the musician or with the costumer or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, the actor has ideas about the part. So uh, you must be open to that kind of collaboration. But I love that story because again, it, it connected with the idea of your imagination is really limitless. And so if you can imagine it, it can come into existence somehow, maybe not physically right in front of us, but uh, it can be uh, in your dreams or in your imagination and be almost as powerful as if it were actually happening. Absolutely. I've never heard of this book. And the way you describe it reminds me somehow of um, family constellation work. Yes. Like they, they are doing a kind of, of therapeutic work right. slash ritual work and in their dreams, in their imagination, in the other world, it plays out. Yes, that's, that's very true. And an interesting thing happened as you said that, I got a physical sensation in my spine, which often happens when someone in a meeting talking about a story says something that's penetrating and true and, and is good for the story, you get a feeling in yes. your body, like, like someone ran their fingers down your spine. And I just got that shiver as you said that. So this is a signal to me that that's a, a, a right idea. I mean, I agree. Uh, that's clearly what the writer was trying to do. He was probably writing about his own childhood and working out different uh, levels of his, uh, his being. And, and, and those kids probably represented parts of him. Mm -hmm. But it certainly played that way for me. Um, I had two sisters and, you know, the, the constellation of the three kids made a, a good uh, pattern for me. But it also led to uh, a lifelong uh, obsession. I was already obsessed, but the, 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 the book it reinforced it. So I have gone quite insane, many people would say, for toy soldiers, especially knights and their ladies and so forth. So these are some figures uh, based on another movie, The Warlord with Charlton Heston, 
And uh, uh, a friend of mine actually made these wonderful, wonderful uh, resin uh, uh, sculptures and uh, makes the castle and everything else. So uh, I can have my childhood fantasies uh, uh, today and, and uh, enjoy that very, very much. How many of them do you have? Um, well, uh, just to the right here, if we can turn a little bit, there's a, a shelf over here that oh, has gosh. about a thousand figures just on, on these shelves. And there are, I don't know, five or 10 times more uh, other places around the house. So uh, it's, it's, it's a full blown obsession and an art form, a kind of expression for me. And you said a good word, it's therapy. It's therapy for me, you know, in, in many ways it helps to balance the books of my life. When things don't go well, I have a world that is completely mine to control. I can paint them, I can cut them apart and put them in different arrangements. I can do anything I want with this world. And uh, it's good to have something like that. If it's fishing or golf or whatever it is for you. But for me, it's these, these toys from my childhood that connect me to my childhood, which for me is very important. Yeah, I imagine. Now, um, uh, <laughs> when, we, when we wrote before this interview, you said uh, you would love to visit Graz and okay, the Armory. Okay, the sound. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, um, you, you, you wrote to me that you would love to visit Graz and the Armory here. Yes. So now I understand better. For, for people uh, who don't know, Graz has um, the, one of the largest, if not the largest armory of um, not quite medieval, but a bit later than that, weapons, uh, at least in Europe. Yes. It's, it's huge and it's very beautiful. And uh, yeah, now I understand why you would love to come and visit it. Yeah, I haven't gone quite so far as to have a complete suit of armor made for myself, but uh, you know, should I live so long, maybe I will. Uh, because I, I, I love to ex experience uh, these other times. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things that it's about for me is uh, as a kid, I was compelled to make little castles out of cardboard, and later they, you know, my parents saw that this was important. So they gave me toy castles and um, I just never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's archetypical. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. It, it touches all those things. Um, I think there's something um, very deep and fascinating about just the human form. Uh, now, mine is the human form in military terms most of the time, but just having lots of little statues of people uh, is, it's, it's just fascinating to me. The craftsmanship, uh, the fact that of this thousand on the shelf here, they're all different. Everyone is different. Uh, they come from many countries. There are many, many levels of uh, amusement and, and, uh, and uh, exploration to be mm -hmm. found in these things. Yeah. So do, do you um, reenact stories with them as well? Or well, the art, yeah, some people do. Uh, the art form for me now is uh, generally to photograph them and show them to my friends on Facebook. Um, we are in groups, you know, and we can compare what we've uh, found and how we arrange it. Uh, and you do find now we're starting to make scenes uh, and sometimes I'll get interested in a period of history, like right now I'm reading about uh, Cortez and his conquest of Mexico, which was very brutal and, uh, you know, they showed a lot of courage, but it was awful in many ways. Um, but that makes great scenes with these little figures, you know, and so that's, that's where I'm going with it these days is, is recreating scenes from history and I have all of the stuff to do it with the buildings and the weapons and the cannons and everything. Uh, so I can make very, very uh, accurate uh, things where if, if they're photographed well, you can't see, tell, is that a frame from a movie with real people? Or if you light it correctly, out, outdoors especially, sunlight makes it look real. And, and so I, that's what we go for. We try to make it 
look uh, as convincing and real as we can. Yeah. So I see this story has never left you. Well, it has, and, it, and, has, it has grown inside of and, you. And it is a kind of um, wish for me. You know, we started with the wish of the boy to try to get up there and uh, find a treasure and be nice, help his mother and so forth. Uh, I have a wish about that book, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the story of the Knight's Castle, uh, that it should be a movie. Mm -hmm. And I think people have tried in the past, and there may even have been a version of it uh, done at some point, but I still feel there's potential there. And so that's one of the things, anytime I am near the uh, machinery that makes movies, That's one of the things I push forward and, and say, uh, have you thought about doing this? Uh, and, and someday I think we'll see a, a really good uh, version of that because it's, it's a great story that's perfect for special effects and modern treatment, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So um, did, did you um, choose another story or? or were you influenced by by these two stories the most in, in your well childhood? i would say um that th these were jumping off points for me because the next step after uh knight's castle was to uh read the material that that was based on you mm -hmm. know and this is part of my always process is to try to go back to the source if i find a good story what influenced that story and what influenced that story And uh, when I worked for Disney, for example, um, they would try to take on some old story like Beauty and the Beast, for instance, or Hercules. And um, my uh, approach to that was always to ask the research department, please find me the earliest versions of these stories that you can. Beauty and the Beast was written down in the 1700s, I think. Um, but uh, It's certainly based on earlier versions that go back probably to the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So I ask research always get me back to the source because that's where the real uh, energy is uh, in these things. So with Knight's Castle, I went back to the source, which is the novel Ivanhoe that was written in the 1820s, I think. And uh, that was an incredibly rich experience for me. Uh, to read an old historical novel as a young person. You know, I was maybe 12 or 13 when I read that. And it wasn't easy, but um, it opened up a whole world uh, for me. And, and I'm still, to some extent, living in, in the, uh, the smoke of that wonderful world. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, um, you couldn't have put it better to demonstrate how stories from our childhood on um, lay out like a, a landscape for us to live in. Well, I forgot completely that it didn't stop with reading Ivanhoe. Later on, I was asked by a friend of mine uh, who was working with Japanese style comic books, what they call manga comic books. And he had a company Uh, to make them in English and then take them to Japan and translate them back to J Japanese. Uh, and he said, do you want to write one of these comic books? And I said, yes, I want to take Ivanhoe, that same story, and tell a sequel to it from the point of view of the villain, because I didn't like the way the villain died. I thought he did not get a fair uh, case and uh, that uh, he was killed in a kind of silly way at the end, and I just didn't accept the ending. So I rewrote it and uh, created a manga comic that's called Raven's Skull, and uh, that was a whole other wonderful collaboration. Again, there's that idea of collaborating because I had to work with an artist, and in the modern way, this was all done by email and exchange of JPEGs. So I would write the script basically uh, and describe the scene. And then I would go to Google images and I would pull out a picture of a stirrup or a saddle or a sword handle or a ceiling or a door or whatever it was. And I sent it to the, the artist who was in the Philippines. 
And I never met him. The editor never met him. Uh, uh, it was all done remotely in the modern way. But it was so wonderful to work with him because I would write, he clatters across the bridge. And then three days later would come a JPEG of the perfect drawing of the knight clattering across the bridge with his cape flying and all these things I had imagined, but I had not said in my uh, description. So uh, he was like reading my mind. And uh, this was so thrilling to, to see, oh, we've, we've connected somehow. And this boy in the Philippines and, and me are seeing the same movie, you know, really. So yeah. that was thrilling to, to, to see. And I love working with artists in that way. It's a little out of your control. That's again, like in the story of the three kids, uh, it gets a little wild sometimes, but uh, you accept that and uh, you get some great effects if you are open to it. It's like sometimes um, I experience it when I'm telling a story or I'm writing a story uh, that uh, it, this is what I do. I'm not inventing it. It's already there. And oh, yeah. I'm just tuning into it or it, it expresses itself through me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful how that happens. Um, a friend of mine, uh, It describes it this way. He says, we are like reaching our hand into uh, through a membrane or something to feel around when you're writing the story, creating the scene. He says, you're putting your hand into plasma, into this glowing hot gas, and you're pulling back out of that and putting it down on the page. And uh, I'm working right now on a, a historical novel that I sort of, uh, I'm inspired by uh, Knight's Castle and by Ivanhoe. Um, and that's happening where I'll, I'll raise a question. What is the wizard doing at this point? What is the queen doing at this point? And I can reach into that space and pull back something. And I'm surprised. She's doing that. She's sitting where? Wow. I didn't, I never thought of that, you know, but there it is. And, and who knows where it's coming from? Don't ask too many questions. <laughs> yeah. You get to the point where you, um, where you wonder if, if you're not um, a person in a story yourself that is being put on the page by someone else or something else or whatever. Yes. Yes. That's, that's ideal is to, to uh, be in that state. So I just try to think of the things that put me into that state of mind. Um, and, and some of that is, is a, a little business you do yourself to collect the pieces that you already know. Uh, like, I know in this scene, I want a dog and I want uh, the horse to rear back and I want the uh, sunlight to be on the flags and I want to uh, hear the trumpets blowing, you know, you, 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 You make a list almost of the, the things you want to see. Um, and then this other thing happens and you, 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 uh, you find the surprises there. And, yeah. and it's just delightful. Yeah. And Better then you find tingles and, and then it's, yeah. 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 And where did that come from? But who cares if it, if it works? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Chris, thank you so much to give us so much insight into um, your way with stories, uh, into your wisdom you gained from it. And um, I'm honored to have you. Um, it's been great talking to you. Yes, thank you, Bernhard. I, I think this is really uh, a great uh, path you're on just to ask this interesting question of people. Uh, I do something similar where I ask people what toys influence them as a child, and you get very interesting answers. Some people don't want to go there at all, and others only want to talk about the sports games and so forth, but some have toys like I did that were important uh, to them. How, how about you? What was your, your uh, influential toy? <laughs> um, a Knight's Castle. <laughs> yes, is it? Yes. Yes. My, my father built it for me um, from, uh, from wood, yeah. and I had a face where Everything medieval was, I, I loved it. Um, and later on, uh, I had this Masters of the Universe um, yes. uh, 
twice. It was the 80s. And uh, uh, I never got the um, uh, Castle Grace Curl or, or Skeletor's Castle. Uh, so I, I played with them in uh, this old uh, castle uh, made of wood. And uh, this Knight's Castle was uh, like the, the starting point. Yeah. And um, yeah. Um, come to think of it, one of my most important magical tools is an imaginative castle. Yeah. Where I go, and uh, that's the entry point to the other world for me. Every room in this castle is. Um, symbolic for for a part in in my life and uh if i i know uh, the the symbolism there represents something in my life and uh if i change something there this part in my life changes and then i venture out from this castle and explore mundus imaginaris as it is called uh the other world so the knight's castle yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, that's just great. I, I can imagine you might have had toys made by a German company called Elastiline uh, that made little plastic figures uh, and uh, around that time. So yeah, you I, I, I know them, but I no, I don't think I had them. But um, yeah, um, and I I like to dress up myself. So th that was also very important for me, yes. not also to, to play with, with toys, but to, to become the, um, the things I were interested in. Then I, I had this uh, Western phase where I um, yeah, become Buffalo Bill or whoever mm -hmm. and, and so on. But well, you have um, the mustache for it right now. <laughs> now I have it, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah um that's, I understand this very, very well. My mother was uh, indulgent. She allowed this. Yeah. And she would make the costumes for me. Yeah. So if I saw the three musketeers, you know, two days later, I'd be out on the sidewalk strutting around, you know, in this silly costume with a big hat with a feather. And all the kids on the street thought I was crazy. You know, like, well, hey, come and play baseball. And take off that silly suit. But uh, I loved it. I just love to uh, to be Zorro or Batman or whatever, you know. Absolutely, I, I can relate, and that's yeah. also a kind of shamanic thing, you know, to yeah. to become yes. the um, the totem or the, the the quality you have to deal with. To Absolutely right. Into its perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. That all those caped and costumed uh, superheroes have that uh, shamanic uh, power or that identity. There's uh, something going on uh, uh, that's bigger than catching the criminals. There's, there's much more to yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Oh, wow. That was such a great conversation, amazing. And uh, Chris, thank you so much. I've uh, got the links to your blog um, and your IMDb in, in the show notes. And um, yeah, whenever the opportunity arises, uh, I'll show you the armory in Graz. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, that's that's perfect for me. That's great. It's good to see you. I do remember you from uh, from Vienna. That was a special trip. So uh, it's good to see you again. Wow. See you soon. Talk soon. All Have right. Nice Thank you. Thank so you. Long. The world is magical.